the Word of God. And it's always a great thing to come before the Lord God Almighty to study His Word. So today, as always, we're going to be studying a very interesting subject, and I thank God for the Word of God because it's endless in the treasures that you can find in the Word of God. You can tell that this book was written by God Almighty. The Bible says that it was written by men of old, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that every single word came from God Almighty. So today, we're going to be studying about honor, because we live in a society that doesn't know what honor means anymore. You know, my generation grew up uh, in a household, in society, in church, in school, where you were taught honor and respect at a very, very young age. But now, that's kind of went out the door because uh, I don't know what happened, but somehow uh, the honor and respect that we should have has gone uh, away. So we're going to take a look at the Word of God because everything that we do in our heart Everything that we say and do should come from the Word of God. So, of course, we want to know what the Holy Scriptures say about honor. You know, and I was really fascinated that as you go through the, the, the Bible, I kind of picked out a, a different verse in each one of the Gospels to show you what Jesus had to say about honor. And it's really, really interesting to see the importance of honor. And, you know, we're going to start out, we're going to start out this afternoon right where Pastor Mike kind of left off this morning. Pastor Mike was reading in the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and he was reading the very last thing that Jesus told the disciples. Who thinks that the last thing that Jesus might have talked about before he left earth might be important to us? It probably is pretty important, but it's a great commission. And Jesus was saying to the disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. All authority, that means, that doesn't let anything for the devil. That doesn't let anything for the darkness, for the demons. It doesn't let anything for them because Jesus said, all authority has been given to Jesus. Now, Jesus has that authority. He has given that authority to us, but he wants us to be mature in our lives before he can trust us with that much power because the power of the Holy Spirit wants to live inside of us, but it just don't come to us just because we want it or desire it. We have to do what Jesus said. And Jesus goes on here, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say how people pray the sinner's prayer. He said that we are supposed to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Teaching and making disciples, teaching all things that I have commanded you to do, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So here Jesus is saying that everything that he talked about for the three and a half years he walked on this planet, you and me are responsible to know that, aren't we? You and me are responsible to not only know it, but to teach it to our children, to teach it to our brothers, our sisters, uh, our co-workers, um, whoever, whoever you hang out with the day. Jesus expects us to teach others his word. And it's not that hard to do because everything that we do should be about God Almighty, shouldn't it? Everything that we are, we're supposed to be prayed up, ready to go in season and out of season, that no matter what happens in our lives, be ready to testify of the goodness inside of you because Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Well, what did Jesus command us? He said to go into all the world and preach the gospel, didn't he? Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But we run into a little bit of a snafu with that, with that laying hands on the sick, don't we? Because Jesus was in his hometown preaching in the synagogue and guess what Jesus couldn't do? The Bible says he couldn't do any miracles, and he only healed a very, very, very few people. What, now, what happened? Jesus was God Almighty, wasn't he? 
Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. What happened that Jesus couldn't do any miracles? That'd be like Aiden getting his toolbox out to fix a, a, a go-kart engine or a car engine, and all of a sudden, he couldn't do it. Well, what would happen? What, there had to be a cause for it, didn't it? So what happened when Jesus entered his hometown of, of Beth, of, um, this, I, I think it said Nazareth, I apologize, but anyway, Jesus entered his hometown and he couldn't do any miracles. Well, there must be a reason for that, must it? And that's what we're gonna take a look at today. What stops the power of God in our life that we don't see the marvelous miracles that they did of old? When, when Peter, James, and John went to town in Jerusalem, what happened? They seen miracle after miracle, after healing, after healing, supernatural things. When the apostle Paul went forth, he had what, healing? Miracles, words of wisdom, words of... These guys were full of the Holy Ghost, but they must have knew something that we don't know. But Jesus told us the secret of what happened when he was in his hometown, didn't he? He told us what happened, that he couldn't even do a miracle. And that catches you by surprise, because you think that God can do what he wants to do, can't he? And basically he can, but he is so sovereign that he follows his own laws, doesn't he? If he made a law of faith, he follows it. If he made a law of love, he follows it. So we're going to take a look at these. But the main thing is we have to understand that Jesus requires us to know everything that he commanded us to do. So if you want to be in the perfect will of God, you have to know what the will of God is for your life. So that now we know that it's God's perfect will for us to go into all the world, lay hands on the sick, and I don't know about you, but when I pray for somebody, I like to hear a good testimony. You know, Friday night we had a prayer meeting here, started at around seven o'clock, and um, uh, there was some people here, you know, and we were praying, and, and we had it on the big screen here that Dutch Sheets and his brother Tim Sheets, uh, they was having a, like a revival at their, at their church in Ohio, but they were, tele they were putting it out on the live screen through the computer system, thank God for the computer system, for all the technology that God Almighty has given us. And it was like 726 churches tuned into it and everybody was in one accord and the Holy Spirit was moving so mightily and so powerful that I've heard testimony after testimony of the goodness that came from them doing that. Now we're, we're hoping that every Friday night we can have a church service here of healing because we know that it's God's will to heal people. But we have to make sure that the Holy Spirit is in one accord with us and that we're in one accord with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, uh, there's a lot that takes place. So with all the testimonies and things we have, we're gonna jump back to the Old Testament. And one thing you gotta learn about teaching out of the Old Testament First thing people will tell you, well, that was the Old Testament. That's been done away with because there's a New Testament, right? That's not true when you hear people saying that the Old Testament was done away with. Jesus said that I am here to fulfill the Old Testament. He didn't say he was here to do away with it, what, did he? He said, I'm here to fulfill. He said that the Old Testament is the foundation for the New the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that since Jesus died and Jesus is sitting on the throne in heaven, that Jesus is making intercession for us as our high priest, that it's a spiritual relationship with God, whereas in the Old Testament, it was a physical relationship with God. You had to bring a, a sheep or a lamb or a goat or whatever God told you to bring as a sacrifice, as an atonement, for your disobedience to God and God accepted your sacrifice as atonement to wash away your sins to make you good enough to come before his presence. God is a holy, righteous God and he does not like when we sin. And sin is a very simple statement of disobeying God Almighty. Sin is disobeying God. Righteousness is obeying God. It's doing the right thing. So when you read about righteousness and you want to be righteous, because what kind of a church is Jesus coming back for? 
a holy, righteous, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, and that's our goal, to be perfect before God Almighty. You say, well, only God's perfect, but G Jesus said, be perfect like your Father in heaven. So it must be able to be accomplished or Jesus wouldn't have said it. So we're going to read a couple of verses here out of Malachi. In the uh, very first chapter of Malachi, see, everybody cringes when you say Malachi because that's the book that God in the third chapter teaches us how to tithe, how to sacrifice, how to bring our offering to the Lord. So everybody cringes when you say Malachi, but you've got to remember that Malachi was a very, very important prophet. He was the last prophet before John the Baptist was born. And there was about a 400, 500 year break in between Malachi and John the Baptist. So God, when God said this, he said, look, I'm done. That's all you get for now. He said, but the Messiah's coming and then it'll pick up from there. But isn't it history so, so enlightening to know that God Almighty has everything ordered for us, that everything is in a chronological order and that God has it all figured out. All we have to do is read the book and follow the book. So in Malachi, the very first chapter, starting with the sixth verse, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> God Almighty says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am your father, the father, where's my honor? Now God's saying to the people, where's my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? See, all of a sudden now the priests and the, the Levites and everybody wants to know, how did we despise your name, Lord? And God Almighty is saying, you didn't honor me. You didn't honor my name, you didn't honor me. Verse 7 says, God Almighty says, You offered defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? Now see, now they're bringing sacrifices that are unacceptable to God. They're lame lambs, they're blind lambs, and they're blind sheep, and, they did, and they're bringing this to God. And God says, The table of the Lord is contemptible. Verse 8, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, God says, is it not evil? And when you offer the lamb and sick, is that not evil? Offer it then to your governor, God says. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept your favorable? Says the Lord of hosts, verse 9. But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to you, while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept your favorability, says the Lord of hosts? Verse 10, who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? See, God says, you're bringing this garbage before me. You're bringing me this junk. You're bringing me less than what you can do. He says, I'm sick of it. He said, why would you bring me your filthy rags that, that's no good at all and offer them to me? And God says, I have no pleasure in you. Now this is a hard message to preach, isn't it? God says, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Now will I accept an offering from your hands? God says, I have no pleasure in you. I'm not accepting you. He said, that, that garbage that you're bringing me is unacceptable. Now, like I say, it's a hard message to preach, but it's in the Bible. If you dishonor God, if there's praise and worship going on in this house, and you come in here and you talk while everybody else has their hands up in the air and their eyeballs closed and they're worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you're going to disregard the Holy Spirit, God says, I'm done with you. I'm done. He says, somebody go out there and lock the door so nobody can come in. I'm, I don't, don't want to hear it. Now, that's not an easy message to preach because Jesus came and Jesus gave us the word of God, didn't he? Jesus came and he told us what 
he expected out of each one of us. But Jesus came with such love. See, the Bible portrays Jesus as being love and kind, but you have to look at both sides of God Almighty. You have the loving side of God Almighty, and you have the judgment side of God Almighty. God doesn't accept disobedience, right? So in Romans chapter 12, it says to be a living sacrifice. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of our Father. Well, we know what his perfect will is. He tells us, doesn't he? To bring the best offering that you have. Well, that might seem like God's a greedy God and he wants everything. Uh, the bottom line is it all belongs to the Lord God Almighty. We belong to the Lord God Almighty. And God sets the parameters of what he'll accept and what he doesn't accept. We don't make the rules, right? So we, now we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Do you all remember when, when, when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they built the big altars out of stones, and the Bible says that they made these altars, right? And now you're going to climb up on that altar as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You see what God expects out of us? He doesn't expect us to, you know, to give, give him whatever's left over, does he? You know, I teach a, a hard doctrine that you get eight hours to sleep, eight hours to, to do what you want to do, and eight hours for God Almighty. Now that's not biblical, but what a standard. If God's going to give you 24 hours in a day, Shouldn't he get the por the, the, a large portion of that? So sleep eight, work eight, and give God the other eight. Now, none of us can hold up to that standard, but why not set the bar so high to set the standard high enough that if you shoot for eight hours a day and only hit an hour, brothers and sisters, you're still doing pretty good, aren't you? If, if you shoot it, set for eight hours and get four hours of, of praying and studying and worshiping and honoring God, that's still pretty good. Believe me, you'll have a lot of clout with God Almighty that your prayers will be uh, heard from heaven above. See, the Bible says that God hears the prayers of his people, but the question is, what does God do with them? God heard the prayers of the people in Jesus' hometown, but could Jesus heal anybody? It says that he couldn't heal anybody. So now we see in the Word of God that God says, don't bring me anything but your perfect honor. Now, we know that through Jesus Christ that God Almighty has a lot of love for us, doesn't he? He has a lot of mercy for us, doesn't he? His grace is so important. But I can't use the word grace without letting you know that you better get a highlighter and you better highlight the word grace everywhere in your Bible and you better write the letters H period, S period above the word grace. Because every place that the word grace is used in the Bible, it means the power of the Holy Spirit working through you. For by grace are you saved. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. You can't go on to the mar without the Holy Spirit and please God. So you have to take the word for by grace, Holy Spirit, are we saved. And every, I went through one of my Bibles and marked it. And the Holy Spirit fits every single place that the word grace is used. So when you break down Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. What do we say faith was? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. The things that you can't see is the voice of Jesus. Jesus says faith comes by hearing. So for by faith in God is how you're saved because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you daily, all day long, nonstop. For by grace are you saved through your faith of the Holy Spirit speaking to you, saying, Lisa, you can do it. I'm here to encourage you. If you mess up, I'll pick you up. Bobby, I'm here to, to help you, to encourage you to witness and evangelize and pray for the sick. And I'm here to help you every single day. That's what I'm here. So now you've heard the voice of Jesus, so you're living by faith, and you've got the grace of the Holy Spirit helping you to do the will of God. So the Bible says that for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God. 
not of yourself. The voice of Jesus has nothing to do with us except for the fact that we have to open our heart for him to come in. So it's a gift from heaven. But remember that gift, that gift alone sets you on the path that Jesus talked about. Jesus said there's two roads, didn't he? There's the broad and wide road that leads to destruction. And we just talked about that, didn't we? That that broad and wide road will lead to everlasting destruction. And Jesus talked about the straight and narrow road, didn't he? That will lead to everlasting life. So when we pray the sinner's prayer, we pray, Father, I give you my heart. Romans 10, 9, 10 says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, what does the word Lord mean? It means master, doesn't it? It means ruler, doesn't it? It means authority, doesn't it? It means if we make Jesus the authority through the word of God and the master of our life, that means when you get up in the morning, you say, Lord, you're the master of my life. What do you want me to do today? Do you want me to work on this? You want me to go there? You want me to do this? What do you want? He's the master, isn't he? See, so, for by, uh, so Romans 10, 9, 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus, he is our master. So now, as you enter into your prayer closet and you establish your relationship and you say, Lord, I offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Are you going to give God the garbage that we just read about, the lame lamb, the blind lamb, the sick lamb, or, or are you going to offer him your best? And God knows our heart, doesn't he? He knows when we offer, offer him the best, right? Well, what would God think that if I got up in the morning and I go out and get in my recliner and just sit there and just watch TV and play on my phone. What's God going to say to me? He is going to say, so that you would not kindle the fire of my order. I have no pleasure in you, Donnie, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept any an offering from your hands. See, he's going to let you know your living sacrifice, it ain't cutting it. It ain't no good. It's got to, you got to step it up a notch. And that's where obedience comes in, doesn't it? that we obey God through the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about honor and we're talking about this generation that, that uh, hasn't really learned what honor means. And you know, to honor, it very simply means to respect, doesn't it? So do we respect God Almighty? Because we live, a, we live honor in our culture Honor is the culture by how the kingdom of God functions. The whole kingdom of God functions off of honor. If you don't respect and honor God, the kingdom of God is no good to you. The kingdom of heaven is no good to you. Everything in the kingdom of God, whether it be the keys to the kingdom, the kingdom laws, the kingdom principles, everything works off of submitting to God and honoring God Almighty. But we have a generation that doesn't respect anything, so how, how are they going to do it, right? So through no respect, no one has respect for anybody. It's even hard sometimes to get respect from people who go to church. They actually, because when you go to a church, it seems like everybody has their walls up. Nah, nobody, nah, not this church, this church here seems to be very kind and very loving, but everybody puts their walls up and everybody's walking in fear. They're afraid that somebody's talking about them. They're afraid that somebody uh, is going to judge them. And they don't trust anybody. And they're not close to anybody in the church. And even in the church, they fear that somebody's going to harm them. But you see, that's because we are a society that doesn't honor people. I love to look at the gift that people have. What, what, what do they bring in, you know, to church with them? What gift do they have? And, and if you learn to honor one another. But what happens to a husband and a wife if they don't honor each other? See, th by studying this here, I've learned that when we have situations in our marriages or between our children, we have to speak the word of God. We have to say what thus saith the Lord, or we're really gonna get ourselves into some trouble, aren't we? Because you know, if you yell and scream at family members or coworkers or a thing, that's not the answer, is it? We have to understand 
that everybody needs the Word of God. We need the light of Jesus inside of us. So we're going to jump over here and go to, to the next set of scriptures. And um, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 41. Matthew chapter 10, 41. Now, in Malachi, we just studied that God wants us to honor him with our best, to give to him best. So then Jesus, here in Matthew chapter 40, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 41, Jesus says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, 41, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And, who, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So Jesus is talking about our perception, isn't he? He says, if you receive a prophet, as a prophet, you're going to get a prophet's reward. But you have to perceive that prophet as a prophet. You have to perceive a righteous man as a righteous man. So our perception is where are we on our walk with Jesus? When you see somebody, do you perceive them as being good? Do you perceive them as being bad? You see, and that's, and that's what we're going to take a look at here in a few minutes uh, as, uh, as we look at the scriptures because you can't receive from me if you don't honor me. If you don't honor the gift that God has given me, I'm no good to you. I can pray to the cows come home, but you're not going to receive anything. And that's what Jesus ran into in the synagogue, isn't it? That Jesus, being God Almighty, they didn't perceive him as the Messiah. So what did they get? Nothing. But you see how the Word of God is so important that we honor God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. You can't receive from a person of God if you don't see the value in them. The greatest healing evangelist can come into this church and lay hands on you. But if you think, well, <clears throat> maybe you read something on the internet <clears throat> bad about that person, and you think that that person's a thief or a liar or something, you're probably not going to be able to receive from them. Why? Because you don't see the gift that's in them. And Jesus said, this is the word of God from heaven above, that if, if you, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. So if you don't perceive them as a healing evangelist, you're not going to get the reward that they bring to the table, are you? So our perception of each other, the honor that we have for each other, <clears throat> is very, very important, isn't it? See, that's why it's important that we pray for one another, isn't it? When you see a brother and sister in church, pray. You, you don't have to pray out, you know, loud. You can pray in the Holy Spirit. You, can, you know, we were talking about the, the prayer gathering Friday night. The prayer gathering was so powerful Friday. The anointing was so strong that everybody was praying for everybody else, right? And praying is simply going before your Father, lifting up the situation because your Father in heaven hears you, doesn't he? Now remember that you can't live a whole, a, a, an unholy and ungodly life and you get off work and you stop at the bar and you carry on and you get drunk and you, or you go to your buddy's house and get high on marijuana and you get, take drugs. And, you can't live that sloppy life. What did God just say? He said, I'm done with it. He said, if you people are going to act like that in church, get somebody to go out there, lock the door, shut it down, it's no good to me. I'm not accepting it. Jesus said to present your body a holy, living sacrifice, didn't it? And that means a righteous, holy sacrifice. So it's very, very important that we don't disrespect one another because obviously honor must mean something to God because right here he goes on and on. Uh, however you perceive a prophet, a righteous man, or even someone who needs a cold drink of water, how you perceive them is how your prayer life is going to carry over towards that person. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. And in this story, <clears throat> there's a lot going on because it says here in Mark chapter 6, Then he, meaning Jesus, went out from there 
and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? Where, where did Jesus get all the word of God? How did Jesus know what to... Remember the Beatitudes in the sixth chapter of Matthew where Jesus said, Blessed is the meek, and blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And ble, ble. Where did Jesus learn all this, they said? How did he know this? Well, him being God Almighty, he just happened to know it, didn't he? So here Jesus is teaching them, Where did this man get all these things? And what wisdom is, is, this, in which, is this which he is given to him? that such mighty works are performed by his hands. Now remember, Jesus is just coming in out, out of the field, wasn't he? He was all over Israel, laying hands on the sick, doing miracles, multiplying the bread, the fish, walking on. He was out there and everybody in Israel is talking about these miracles that Jesus did. They said, how, did he, how, how does he do that? Verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Josh, Judas, Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were all offended at Jesus. Jesus is teaching the gospel. Well, guess who's the very first people to judge you when you teach out of the Bible, right? And my little grandchildren all the time say, Pappy, should you really be preaching the gospel? Should you really be talking about Jesus in front of all them people? You know, really, are you really a preacher? See, in their mind, I'm Pappy, right? Or my children would say, well, Dad, are you, are you really called to be a preacher? Uh, the Bible says that we're all called to be ministers of reconciliation. It? it says that we're all to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I thank God for the technology because right now, this message is going around the world and there's 8 billion, probably more than 8 billion people that have access to hear the word of God because of the technology that our Father in Heaven made. But these people want to know why, where did Jesus get all this knowledge at? And verse number four says, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. See, a prophet's honored everywhere but his own country. And a preacher of the gospel is honored everywhere, but probably not in his, whole, in his own house because of the spirits of familiarity. People see your everyday life and they know that you get up in the morning that you drink a cup of coffee, that you maybe go to work, or maybe you go out and mow the grass, and they see you eating food, and they say, oh, there's nothing supernatural about Pappy. He's just a regular, ordinary man. He puts his shirt and his shoes on just like we do. And you see, they don't honor the gift of the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. And that honor that they, that they don't see drags their faith level down, and God says, without honor, he says, I can't do anything. So you see what happened to Jesus here. The fourth verse says, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own, in his own house. Verse 5, Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. Why didn't they believe in Jesus? He just came in out of the field. He just healed thousands and thousands of people. Why did they believe? Because they chose to believe that Jesus was the carpenter's son, didn't they? They dishonored the gift that was inside of him. And therefore, you get nothing. You dishonor the pastor that's in this pulpit, you get nothing. You can pray to the cows come home. It's biblical. Jesus said, you get nothing. Jesus said, if you go into the temple, if your offering is some lame duck or some lame lamb or a blind lamb, you get nothing. Now that's biblical. You say, well, I thought the Bible says in Mark eleven twenty four 24, that whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we shall have. Whatsoever things you desire in your heart, you shall have. What's in your heart? Your heart has to be right with God. Jesus has to be the Lord of your life. So we have to be very, very cautious. You know, the other day I was, we have a small farm with cows and goats and chickens and all that stuff. And I was on, on, on the golf cart and I was way down in the backfield, way down. In, in, and I'm getting kind of old, so it's easier to ride the golf cart. 
Well, the golf cart kind of stopped when I got as far away from the barn as I can get. So I have a good, good you know, I stay in communication with my Father in Heaven all the time, so I'm always praying along, worshiping, doing something. So when the golf cart stopped, of course, you know, I'm, I look up to heaven, I said, really, Lord, really? You're going to let this thing stop? So I got to walk up to the barn now, find the gas jug, and walk all the way back down. I said, really? Right? And the Lord said, yeah, really. Right? So I get off the golf cart, and I start walking up the uh, road there to the barn. And the Holy Spirit said, count the cost. I said, what are you saying, Lord? I mean, what, what does that mean, count the cost? He said, Donnie, before you go out to pray for the sick, he said, you have to make sure that you're full of me. Before you can drive a golf cart, you got to make sure it don't have to be full of gas, but it's got to have gasoline in it, doesn't it, right? So I started telling this testimony to, to some guys, right? And I got to halfway do the testimony, and the one guy just shut me down. He said, Donnie, we already know that the Lord ran that golf cart with no gasoline in it, and you drove it back up there. No, I said, I uh, wish that's the way it happened, but it didn't happen that way. I said, because see, these guys that, that, that I hang out with, they know that God always does some kind of fantastic miracle over the top because, you know, that's, what, that's just what God does, right? But this day, God just wanted to slow me down, slow enough to say, count the cost. Don't go out and pray for the sick, lay hands on the sick, or, or try to lead somebody to Jesus if you haven't spent time with the Holy Spirit. You see, the, entor the importance is that you have to have your, right, your heart right, and your heart has to be in the right condition. And there's so many people you talk to about you know, going out and laying hands on people that are sick or, or to minister to people, and I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not. And what they're saying is they don't have a relationship with Jesus that's conducive to do that. Well, suppose we came to church Friday night and we weren't prayed up and we wasn't in the, in the right spirit and it comes time to lay hands on the sick. See, that's why the Bible says to be ready in season and in, in, in season and out. In other words, be, be prepared at all times to tell somebody about the faith that lives inside of you. Everything that we say and everything that we do, I, I love it out there where we work. I'm, I'm only working part time now when, when all the other People take off, they call me in to, to fill in, right? Well, you know what amazes me? There'll be two or three guys, when they see Donnie in the parking lot or something, they all come running at one time now. And I'm thinking, Lord, it's not Donnie that's drawing these guys there. It has to be the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus that, that you honor. You see, you honor these workers, these other workers. You honor them, and no matter what happens, and, and we had like a major screw-up the other day where, where one of the... the the load tickets got messed up and the, we almost lo loaded the wrong feed on the wrong truck and and it was a common uh, not a common but it was something that happened because with all the drivers off each driver holds a, di a different type thing but because i was filling in it just turns out that that load and luckily the boss overheard us talking about what kind of feed we was going to put on this truck and the boss comes running donnie let me see that paperwork he said, you can't put that feet on that truck. That's not where it's, thank God for miracles. But you see, that's like our Father in Heaven. He's always listening, isn't he? And he knows what people have need of before they even ask. They know, he already knows, right? And, you know, the, the, everybody's going through some type of calamity. But when you tell them that God Almighty is always on the scene, always ahead of us, always has a plan, I don't know how he does it. But he does it, doesn't he? And this is what Jesus was telling us, that he could do no mighty works. And it says, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the village in a circuit teaching. He was trying to put the word of God in their heart so that the next time he came to town, well, I don't know if you all remember, the next time he came to town, they grabbed a hold of him in the synagogue, didn't they? The whole mob, and they tried to throw him over the cliff because he declared that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, now, anybody who reads the Old Testament could tell you that there's hundreds of verses that declare when the Messiah, where the Messiah, how the Messiah, everything about the Messiah was, is in the Old Testament. All they had to do was read the book, but guess what? They chose not to read the book. It's just like our society right now. Look what we're going through 
in our government and in society where people don't want to read the book. Now, we just read Malachi. That was a very, very sharp word that God says, close the church down, lock the doors, and everybody go home because I'm not accepting anything. Thank God for Jesus Christ who intercedes for us and makes a way where there is no way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we, we, I was just thinking this morning about how thankful we should be that Jesus went to that cross. Because if Jesus didn't go to that cross, there's no hope for us, is there? There's absolutely no hope. And because of what he did, there's always hope for us. So Jesus couldn't do any mighty works because of dishonor. So watch what you do in your life when you're dishonoring a brother, a sister, a boss, a co-worker, anybody that you come in contact. Suppose somebody runs you off when you drive to Gettysburg, runs you off the road or going around the square. Should we dishonor them? Or maybe say a prayer, Lord, open their eyes that they might be able to see you. And, you know, we don't have to get angry and upset every time something happens because God's already in control of it, isn't he? If you pray, I always say to people who's having calamity or problems, did you start your day with God? Did you start your day with prayer? I, I've learned that, that, that you need to honor God first thing when your feet hit the floor in the morning, you have to honor him and go before his throne and pray, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come this day. We want the kingdom of heaven to come, don't we? We want the kingdom, the Holy Spirit, to go before us in everything that we say and everything that we do. And then I, I, I always somehow, before I conclude, is, Lord, rebuke the devourer. That's in the third chapter of Malachi. God says that if you're in covenant with him, he will rebuke the devourer. Yesterday I was driving a tractor and trailer. I was telling my wife when I come home from work, that right below Harrisburg there where 581 comes on, I'm in my truck, I'm in my lane, right, big tractor and trailer, great big long thing, and this guy comes on 15 south, and he, it's a big old pickup truck pulling one of them 35 foot long campers, right? And he thought that his camper was past me, and he brought that camper right over in my lane. I mean, when I looked out the passenger side window of the tractor and trailer, all I seen was a white camper about a half inch from the side of my tractor and trailer and like there's nowhere to go and this guy just kept coming over right when I'm thinking oh he's probably got a wife and little kids in that truck and this and that there and and he's gonna tangle that big truck ain't moving I'm telling you that big truck somehow the Holy Spirit I guess when I scream the name of Jesus somehow when I hit the brakes on that tractor it it went completely like sideways the cab did and it didn't affect the trailer, but when it went sideways, I got slowed enough that he was able to keep on coming over, and it just, it only missed the front bumper by at a half inch, but what would happen if your angels weren't with you in a time like that? Because that camper is going to crumble down the highway and roll over and, and just everything. But remember, start your day with prayer, and let's say, Lord, rebuke the devourer. But we can't rebuke the devourer. We're human beings. We have no, no power. But if you remember in Matthew 28, we just read, what did Jesus say? All power is given to me. The devil has no power except for what you give him. Now, always remember, don't make a habitation a place for the devil to live. In other words, if you're doing evil, like we just looked at it in, in Malachi, if you're not giving God your best, you're being influenced by the devil. So you're creating a habitation for the devil to live in. I have a rule in my life, don't create a habitation for evil spirits to live in. Don't look at bad things on your phone. Don't look at bad shows on TV. Don't hang out with bad people. You're creating a habitation. I get around one old farmer and he uses that SOB word, every other word out of his mouth is, you know that garbage gets on you, it gets in your mind, and then you've got to rebuke it, and then you've got to cleanse your, your mind. But every time I see this one farmer, he has to use them foul words and, and, and they'll get into you if you let them. But if you create a habitation, the devil's allowed to inhabit you, isn't he? He's allowed to come in and 
He doesn't inhabit us. He influences our mind to the point where these, these spirits just keep saying over and over, you know, about this or about that or, you know, it, it might be whatever your weakness might be that you go to bars or hang out with, with people who don't honor God. You don't want to hang around people like that because it, it'll get on you and before you know it, you're going to have a problem with your thinking. And I don't know about you, but I like to present my body a holy, acceptable sacrifice to my Lord God Almighty. So um, that's the uh, sixth chapter of, of um, Mark. Let's jump back here to the, to the tenth chapter of Luke, and I think we're going to close right here in the tenth chapter of Luke. And um, it's a very popular story that, that, that we see a lot of, but there's so much that we can get from each one of these stories. Because this is the story of Mary and Martha. Remember Mary and Martha? Jesus comes up, knocks on the door, they open the door, and Jesus comes in. So we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 10, the 38th verse. And it says, Now it happened, as they went, that he, that he, meaning Jesus, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Now, do you see there's no honor in that? She didn't honor Jesus. Here the Messiah is sitting in your house. Can you imagine this, the Messiah coming to your house? I'd like to sit down with Jesus and just chitter chat with him a little bit, right? And that's what Mary wanted to do. She just wanted to sit down and have a little conversation with you. But Martha didn't see the value in Jesus. So guess what Martha got? She got the physical side of the whole scenario. She got the physical side of Jesus. Mary, the Bible says, she said, Lord, don't, do, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Now she's bossing Jesus around, isn't she? Verse 41, And Jesus answered and said to Martha, 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 you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. So when Jesus entered his house, was he 50% man and 50% God? No, he was 100% God. He was 100% the Son of Man. But what did Mary see? Mary seen the God side of him. In our relationship with God, do you see the physical things that when you go to God, you say, Lord, I need this, Lord, I want that, Lord, I desire this. Do you see the physical side of it or do you see the spiritual revelation that God can give you. I love when we get revelation knowledge. I love when God just whispers one little word in, in, into, into our, our lives. So Mary chose the, the greater thing. Now Jesus, when he walked into the house as a son of man, Martha seen the humanity part of him, didn't she? She seen that she wanted the, the pillows all fluffed <coughs> and, the, and the dust off the walls and the floors. She, <coughs> she seen the physical side, but uh, Mary, she was in a posture of worship, wasn't she? She was worshiping Jesus, and she was honoring Jesus, and she was praising Jesus and glorifying, because she realized that Jesus was the Messiah. She's seen the deity side of God, the power that God Almighty created everything. So this is how you and me have to honor God, but we also, the previous verse said you have to honor a prophet, Honor a Christian, honor someone who needs something. We have to honor everybody. And God says, if we learn to honor, see, like I say, our society learned to honor. My little grandson, he's 20 years old, and he's down at Lackland Air Force Base. He left about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. Now. But guess what he's learning? He's learning how to honor, isn't he? If he don't honor the drill sergeant, what happens? He learns, they learn how to honor. So we have to self-discipline ourselves to learn how to honor God. Look back at Malachi and say, Lord, I don't want to bring my sloppy seconds. I don't want to give you what's left over. You know, so many people wait to 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night to say their prayers at night. Do you really, I mean, God is so thankful that you're praying. But do you, uh, you, if you listen to the Holy Spirit, the dialogue, the Holy Spirit will say, really? 
You couldn't do this first thing in the morning so we could have the whole day. What are you saying? If you wait till you go to bed to say your prayers, really? The day's already going. We can't change anything. Well, maybe you're going to pray about tomorrow. I don't know. It depends upon your heart. But you see what I mean? God says, start it in the morning and be obedient to me. Hey, a lot of times the Holy Spirit tells me to do things during the day. I say, Lord, Lord, I wanted to do, go get this done. Go do this. Go here. Go do that. See, it's a matter of being obedient, isn't it? So you've got to prioritize your, your, your life. But with Mary and Martha, Martha was busy with the physical. Mary was busy in the spirit, looking for that revelation, looking for that word. So a while later, whenever Lazarus died, what do you think Mary did? Mary said, just trust it, even though they were both broke up pretty bad. I mean, their brother died. What do you think Mary did? Mary looked at that revelation knowledge that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live forever. But Martha probably, she thought, well, I got to get the house clean because we're going to have a funeral. We got to do, see, it's the physical side of the thing. But we've got to learn to honor God and learn the word of God of what he wants us to do. So that's all I'm going to share for today. I hope that you got something out of that, that we have to honor one another because it affects our relationship all through the Bible. It talks about honor, doesn't it? So we're going to close in a word of prayer and thank God for his word. Father, we thank you once again for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you teach us about honor and about submission to you, Father. Lord, you are the Lord of our life. You are the God that we serve. And Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. And Lord, we pray that you help us in our daily walk, that we grow closer to you and that we, that we can hear your voice more clear each day that we live, Father, that we might be obedient to everything that you have for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.